Good morning, boys and girls. Today's read aloud is about one of my favorite athletes of all time. And her name was Wilma Rudolph. And she was in the Olympics um, quite a few years before I was born. But her story is amazing. This book is called Wilma Unlimited, How Wilma Rudolph Became the World's Fastest Woman. Wilma Unlimited. By Kathleen Crow. No one expected such a tiny girl to have a first birthday. In Clarksville, Tennessee, in 1940, life for a baby who weighed just over four pounds at birth was sure to be limited. But most babies didn't have 19 older brothers and sisters to watch over them. Most babies didn't have a mother who knew home remedies, and a father who worked several jobs. Most babies weren't Wilma Rudolph. Wilma did celebrate her first birthday, and everyone noticed that as soon as this girl could walk, she ran or jumped instead. She worried people, though. She was always so small and sickly. If a brother or sister had a cold, she got double pneumonia. If one of them had measles, Wilma got measles, too, plus mumps and chicken pox. Her mother always nursed her at home. Doctors were a luxury for the Rudolph family. And anyway, only one doctor in Clarksville would treat black people. This was during the times of segregation when black people and white people were not allowed to go to the same schools, hospitals, doctors, couldn't even sit together on a bus. Just before Wilma turned five, she got sicker than ever. Her sisters and brothers heaped all the family's blankets on her, trying to keep her warm. During that sickness, Wilma's legs, Wilma's left leg twisted inward, and she couldn't move it back. Not even Wilma's mother knew what was wrong. The doctor came to see her then, and besides scarlet fever, he said Wilma had also been stricken with polio. In those days, most children who got polio either died or were permanently crippled. There was no cure. The news spread around Clarksville. Wilma, that lively girl, would never walk again. <clears throat> but Wilma kept moving any way she could. By hopping on one foot, she could get herself around the house, to the outhouse in the backyard, and even on Sundays to church. Wilma's mother urged her on. Mrs. Rudolph had plenty to do, cooking and cleaning, sewing patterned flower sacks into clothes for her children, now twenty-two in all. Yet twice every week, she and Wilma took the bus to the nearest hospital, the one that would treat black patients some fifty miles away in Nashville. They rode together in the back, the only place blacks were allowed to sit. Doctors and nurses at the hospital helped Wilma do exercises to make her paralyzed leg stronger. At home, Wilma practiced, practiced them constantly, even when it hurt. To Wilma, what hurt most was that the local school wouldn't let her attend because she couldn't walk. Tearful and lonely, she watched her brothers and sisters run off to school each day, leaving her behind. Finally, tired of crying all the time, she decided she had to fight back, somehow. Even the schools were segregated. The black children had to go to a different school. <clears throat> Wilma worked hard. She worked so hard at her exercises that the doctors decided she was ready for a heavy steel brace. And with the brace supporting her legs, she didn't have to hop anymore. School was possible at last. But it wasn't the happy place she had imagined. Her classmates made fun of her brace during playground games. She could only sit on the sidelines, twitchy with impatience. She studied the other kids for hours, memorizing moves, watching the ball zoom through the rim of the bushel basket they used as a hoop. Wilma fought the sadness by doing more leg exercises. Her family always cheered her on, and Wilma did everything she could, she could to keep them from worrying about her. At times, her leg really did seem to be getting stronger. Other times, it just hurt. <clears throat> One Sunday on her way to church, Wilma felt especially good. 
She and her family had always found strength in their faith, and church was Wilma's favorite place in the world. Everyone she knew would be there, talking and laughing and praying and singing. It would be just the place to try the bravest thing she had ever done. She hung back while people filled the old building. Standing alone, the sound of hymns coloring the air, she unbuckled her heavy brace and set it by the church's front door. Taking a deep breath, she moved on. She moved one foot in front of the other, her knees trembling violently. She took her mind off her knees by concentrating on taking another breath and then another. Whispers rippled throughout the gathering. Wilma was walking. Row by row, heads turned towards her as she walked alone down the aisle. Her large family, all her family's friends, everyone from school, each person stared wide-eyed. The singing never stopped. It seemed to burst right through the walls and into the trees. And finally, Wilma reached a seat in the front and began singing too. Her smile, triumphant. Wilma practiced walking as often as she could after that, and when she was 12 years old, she was able to take off the brace for good. She and her mother realized she could get along without it, so one memorable memorable day, they wrapped the, the hated brace in a box and mailed it back to the hospital, and as soon as Wilma sent that box away, she knew her life was beginning all over again. After years of sitting on the sidelines, Wilma couldn't wait to throw herself into basketball, the game she had most liked to watch. She was skinny, but no longer tiny. Her long, long legs would propel her across the court and through the air, and she knew all the rules and all the moves. In high school, she led her basketball team to one victory after another. Eventually, she took the team all the way to the ten Tennessee State Championships. There, to everyone's astonishment, her team lost. Wilma had become accustomed to winning. Now she slumped on the bench, all the liveliness knocked out of her. But at the game that day was a college coach. He admired Wilma's basketball playing, but was especially impressed by the way she ran. He wanted her for his track and field team. With his help, Wilma won a full athletic scholarship to Tennessee State University. She was the first member of her family to go to college. Sadly, at that time in 1960, Wilma would not be allowed into most colleges because she was black. She would have to go to what were referred to as historically black colleges, HBC. Eight years after she mailed her race away, Wilma's long legs and years of hard work carried her thousands of miles from Clarksville, Tennessee. The summer of 1960, she arrived in Rome, Italy, to represent the United States at the Olympic Games as a runner. Just participating in the Olympics was a deeply personal victory for Wilma, but her chances of winning, winning a race, were limited. Simply walking in Rome's shimmering heat was a chore, and athletes from other countries had run faster races than Wilma ever had. Women weren't thought to run very well anyway. Track and field was considered a sport for men and the pressure from the public was intense. For the first time ever, the Olympics would be shown on television, and all the athletes knew that more than 100 million people would be watching. Worst of all, Wilma had twisted her ankle just after she arrived in Rome. It was still swollen and painful on the day of her first race. <clears throat> Yet, once it was her turn to compete, Wilma forgot her ankle and everything else. She lunged forward, not thinking about her fear, her pain, or the sweat flying off her face. She ran better than she had ever had before, and she ran better than anyone else. Grabbing the attention of the whole world, Wilma Rudolph of the United States won the 100-meter dash. No one else even came close. An Olympic gold medal was hers to take home.
So when it was time for the 200 meter dash, Wilma's graceful long legs were already famous. Her ears buzzed with the sounds of the crowd chanting her name. Such support helped her ignore the rain that was beginning to fall. And at the crack of the starting gun, she surged into the humid air like a tornado. Ooh, nice simile there. When she crossed the finish line, she had done it again. She finished far ahead of everyone else. She had earned her second gold medal. Wet and breathless, Wilma was exhilarated by the double triumph. The crowd went wild. The 400 meter relay race was yet to come. Wilma's team faced the toughest competition of all. And as the fourth and final runner on her team, it was Wilma who had to cross the finish line. <clears throat> Wilma's teammates ran well, passed the baton smoothly, and kept the team in first place. Wilma readied herself for the dash to the finish line as her third teammate ran towards her. She reached back for the baton and nearly dropped it. And as she tried to recover from the fumble, two other runners sped past her. Wilma and her team were suddenly in third place. Ever since the day she'd walked down the aisle at church, Wilma had known the power of concentration. Now, legs pumping, she put her mind to work. In a final electrifying burst of speed, she pulled ahead, and by a fraction of a second, she was the first to blast across the finish line. The thundering cheers matched the thundering of her own heart. She had made history. She had won for an astounding third time. Wilma Rudolph won three gold medals at this Olympics. At her third ceremony that week, that week, as the band played the Star Spangled Banner, Wilma stood tall and still like a queen, the last of her three Olympic gold medals hanging around her neck. Wilma Rudolph, once known as the sickliest child in Clarksville, had become the fastest woman in the world. Author's note, Wilma Rudolph became, at age 20, the first American woman to win three gold medals at a single Olympics. When she returned home from Rome, her family was waiting for her, and so was all of Clarksville, Tennessee. The huge parade and the banquet held in her honor were the first events in the town's history to include both black and white people. During the time of Wilma's childhood in the 1940s, polio, also known as infantile paralysis, was the world's most dreaded disease. A cure for it was not found until 1955. By then it had killed or crippled 357,000 Americans, mostly children, only 50,000 fewer than the number of Americans who had died in World War II. After she retired from her career as a runner in 1962, Wilma became a second grade teacher and a high school coach. She remained a much admired celebrity, but to prove that there was more to her than just running, she started a company called Wilma Unlimited that gave her opportunities to travel, lecture, and support causes she believed in. Later, she found the nonprofit Wilma Rudolph Foundation to nurture young athletes and to teach them that they too can succeed despite all odds against them. The story of all she overcame in order to win at the Olympics has inspired thousands of young athletes, especially women. Wilma Rudolph died in 1994. Um, I really like this story because it shows how far the United States of America has come. Sometimes it seems like progress is slow, but it does come. That's the good thing about the United States. When Wilma Rudolph became a worldwide celebrity in 1960 by winning three gold medals, she came back to a country where she was not equal. She didn't have the same voting rights. She didn't have the same civil rights as white Americans. Um, so we live in a much different country today. And thanks to people like Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King and Wilma Rudolph, Things probably changed a little faster than they would have. She was a great American. Thanks, Wilma Rudolph. 
See you guys tomorrow.